Hello everyone, I'm Stephen W. Long, this is The Writing Life, and uh, we're going to continue with uh, sort of a celebration of Poetry Month, and I have to say I am so pleased to have Eleanor Berry here, uh, and without, uh, I don't mean to embarrass at all, but uh, you bring a little class to the, to the show, so <laughs> thank you for that. And in fact, uh, I could call you Dr. Berry. But I'd be very happy being called Eleanor. Okay, well then we'll do we'll do Eleanor. But uh, we chatted a little bit before we started here, and I think there's so much to cover. And I don't want to dwell on this because this is your show. But could you just mention your husband and and just kind of the what, what he's up to? And I say that particularly because you collaborate. We do collaborate. Yeah. My um, my husband. Um, Richard Berry is is a astronomer and writer about astronomy. Yeah. Um, we we and and also a fine amateur photographer. We do love to work together mm -hmm. um, uh, with poetry and photography, and I try in at least some of my poetry to incorporate a fair amount of science. Um, the language of science and uh, to accurately represent uh, sci aspects of scientific okay. worldview in the poetry so that they can be experienced. Uh, okay. So I don't want to misstate or misquote you, but I think I, I read this if I remember correctly, that you use that scientific language, but not specifically for it's more the sound of it, is that, it's, would that it's, be fair? It's partly the sound of it, I mean all, all language used in poetry is used partly for okay. the sound, okay. partly for the rhythm. The way I think about language in poetry um, is that poetry is an extraordinary means of thinking with language oh, because boy. you think with the whole body of the language. Okay. You think with the sound. You think with the movement. Um, you think with the look of the text on the page. Um, all those things enter into the way the words you choose, the way you order them, the way you um, shape them on the page. So you're talking about the look on the page. <clears throat> I, I mean, we're doing the show. I love poetry. Not that I'm particularly good at it, but I really like it. Uh, but I think uh, when somebody maybe doesn't have a feeling for poetry, they'll look at that and think it's pretentious. Well, why, you know, why, why is the line break there? Why is, why is it indented like this? Um, but it does influence the way that you uh, interpret it, I suppose. It, it does. One way to think of it is it's an additional form of punctuation. Okay. Some, for some poems, um, poets, including myself, will do away with any other kind of punctuation because those breaks between lines, those breaks between groups of lines, mm -hmm. those indentations are sufficient indications in the the white space may sig may for an oral performance signal pause length of pause uh, sort of drawing out of a sound in silent reading it can be sort of a focusing of attention um, uh, taking Taking a, uh, taking a little while to absorb what has just okay. been read. Well, I've never heard a, a, a better explanation. Uh, I remember reading about punctuation. The punctuation is just it's just to guide the reader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why not with the spacing and, and indentation yeah. and so on? Yeah. Now, I, of course, I know this word, and <laughs> I'm going to say uh, prosody. Prosody. Okay. Ah, yes. Well, I read that, and uh, I didn't know what it meant. 
But uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, that, um, that in my scholarly background has been my focus. And yes, what is it? The first, I remember when I first encountered the word, I thought it must have something to do with prose. They, oh, they, sure. They, they look and sound pretty much the same. Yeah. But no, <clears throat> with, with poetry, it refers to the, the whole form of the poem, every aspect of the form of the poem. Okay. In older traditional verse, people are talking primarily about the meter okay. um, and the rhyme scheme. Um, in verse that doesn't use um, syllable counting meters, um, that doesn't have regular rhyme schemes, you're, ta you're, you're looking for other aspects that control the sound and music, the whole structure so of the poem. Music is the, the, the key. I think the etymology of the word is, uh, it has to do with uh, a song. Ah, yeah. I, I haven't, I, I'd forgotten that. Yeah, I well, probably I, knew it at some point. You put me on that track, I had to look it up. I'm glad you <laughs> did, I'm glad you did. Yeah. No, because that's, and that's, that's a passion for me. Um, my, I never had an MFA. I, I, I never studied creative writing. Mm -hmm. I studied literature. I mm -hmm. studied poetry, um, and the um, periods of poetry that I particularly focused on um, were English Renaissance and American and 20th century American. Okay. And my doctoral dissertation was on William Carlos Williams. Oh boy. On on the grammatical and prosodic form of his poetry at a time when people didn't know how to talk about it. It was generally thought of as more or less form less. Uh, so it was developing a, a language and tools to talk about it. And I learned so much mm -hmm. from him about what you can do with lines. Um, I had, in my doctoral research, I had the opportunity to uh, to look at his own manuscripts. Really? Which were typescripts um, from the, it, he, he was a medical doctor in the days when doctors did house calls and he drove around a lot. Um, so he'd scribble notes on prescription pads. But then in in his, office behind the, where he met with patients, there was a typewriter like this. Mm -hmm. And there were the type scripts. And he would type and retype and retype, fiddling with line breaks, fiddling with okay, stanza the arrangements. Look of it. <clears throat> and I mean, those things mattered. They, they guide where you put the emphasis. They guide uh, how you read it, do you read it smoothly, do you read it mm -hmm. um, with a syncopated movement, all that affects the feel of the poem. So, yeah, I, 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 I no MFA, but very careful. Um, I, 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 I learned from one of the masters. Boy. And this is, I knew I couldn't recite it, but uh, the, the poem about the plums, I think, uh, isn't that his? Yes, that's, that's, that's and his then there's indeed. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that one, uh, there is a little story about that. That was the, the, um, uh, I have eaten, oh, I'm going to lose it. Uh, I have eaten, you know, <laughs> and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Right. Forgive me. Right. They were sweet and so cold. Um, but I've forgotten right now, at the very beginning, it will come back to me as soon <laughs> as the show is it's over. over. Yeah. Um, You'll wake up at night. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, that, that holds up that little bit of, of intimate conversational language, mm -hmm. um, makes it, makes it, an object in language as palpable as those plums. Uh -huh. 
you were talking about academia. Uh, you, you're a teacher. You have been a teacher. I have. I have. Uh, I've always been kind of, kind of uh, drawn to some of the rigors of academe, but uh, simultaneously drawn to the the rich mixture of of non-academic poetry in the community. Okay. So for good good many years now. 20, 20 some years I've been outside of academe, okay. but very active in the, the grassroots poetry community. Well, and can you talk a little bit about that? Because you have been, you're the past president of? Um, both the Oregon Poetry Association and the National Federation of yeah. State Poetry Societies. Okay. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, I, I think a lot of people wouldn't have a clue, probably me included. What is that about? What goes on? What do you promote? What's the purpose of this organization? Um, is the, the underlying purpose is to promote poets and poetry and, and spread awareness of them and build community among poets so they can uh, share work, support one okay. another. Um, be, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, a wonderful ferment when <laughs> poets get together. Um, coming up at the end of May, beginning of June, is the annual convention of the National Federation of State Poetry Societies. Um, this year it will be in Denver, Colorado, oh. um, closer than it's been for a while. Um, poets from all over the country will be there. There will be workshops and presentations and really? readings workshops. by, okay. by um, celebrated poets from that state, um, when when you go to a state, you you get to experience um, the distinguished poets in that state's poetry culture and the mm -hmm. sense of of that poetry culture, and then those of us who come from all over the all over the country, um, sharing our work with each other. Is there? Um we, we recognize regional dialects. If, mm -hmm. if somebody, I, th I think uh, somebody from Illinois has a particular way of saying wash, which they, I think they say wash, and, and, and then the East Coast, they're identifying things. Could you tell from a, a reading a poet where they're from? And I'm thinking of two things. One is subject matter. So you talk about Colorado. And I was thinking, well, is it all like mining and ranching and so on? So then in addition to subject matter, is there a, a sensibility that is different, or is poetry kind of poetry? Uh, I, I think the answer is sort of both, and okay. it, it, it varies a lot from poet to poet. I'm one of those poets for whom where I am is very, very yeah. important, yeah. but I haven't been in one place. I grew up in southern Connecticut. I lived a good part of my adult life around the Great Lakes, mm. um, the upper Midwest and also in Canada. Um, and then I came here. Every time I, it, it's really a, a sort of traumatic transplantation every time I move. And part of it is that a great deal of my language comes from the natural landscape right. and, and the human uh, world but especially the natural landscape around me. So moving from one region to another is learning a whole new language. Um, that was essentially the subject of, of my first um, collection of poems, Green November. Okay. Um, but, but, yeah. One of the delights of the convention, the NFSPS convention, is just hearing all those voices. Sure. Um, and I just love the texture. Well, I'm thinking of the cowboy poets. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes, and, yes. And, uh... I, I, I'm remembering one thing I never expected when we went to Florida was Florida has its own cowboy poets. Really? They have a whole different kind of cowboy culture there. Yeah. Um, but they'd be alligator wranglers or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was a great segue. And, and I do want to, 
hear your poetry. Could you go ahead and read uh, uh, maybe first from Green November? And, or what do you have out there? I, I, have, no, I have both books out okay. here. And hmm, I, I know you expressed an interest in, in hearing a poem called To Go Back, mm -hmm. which isn't specific, doesn't specifically touch on what we just talked about, but I chose to put it in a book that had to, that had to do with acclamation. And I guess one of the questions in, when, when you're struggling with acclamation is, do you want to go back? And where do you want to go back? How badly to? do you want to fit in? <clears throat> do you want to give up the past? And it, for me, there's different there's different possibilities of going back. And the farthest is to where I started from. And that's what that's what this one deals with. To go back, not for anything, would I want to go back? to the huge forsythia whose long branches arched into a tent where I could crouch for hours, unseen, to the swing where I could hurl my hot child self high above the tall shrub borders, glimpse the worlds of neighbors' yards invisible from the ground, to the scent of the syringa blooming right outside the open kitchen window, aching sweetness mingling with the smells of Saturday breakfast. My father's coffee and the cornbread, brown sugar melted on top, that my mother baked but never ate, starving herself for years before I began to notice. I only wish I could leave them finally behind. Um, that's more than that, 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 that's a very specific personal past, not just you, a region. Well, but it is. But uh, when I talk to you about this, I don't have that experience, but I have the experience as a child of, of hiding in, I had mm. a, a, there was a lilac bush that I had a little camp in and, and, uh, and hid in. But I was going to say, we've got, I don't know what, 75 words, 100 words, and there's a whole movie there. And it, and it, it, it unfurls or it, it progresses each of those scenes with, with the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the motion, the sight, the smell, the scent. Mm -hmm. um, I just, that, that was one that grabbed me. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. and, and that's what one hopes out of one's own particulars that there will be a connection yeah. to another person's particulars. Yeah. Um, yes, that was, that was my personal retreat, but I, you know, part of me knows, of course, other children had their retreat. Right, too. well, retreat, but uh, there's some bitterness, or bittersweet maybe. Oh uh, yeah. Or that's not the right word either. Um, well, there's there's some there's some pain here, some and pain. and there is there is some bitterness. And I'll tell you a little bit about how this one got started. Yeah. Um, I I usually my poems my ideas from my poems come from myself. And, sure. And in this case, I was I was in um, at a I think it was an Oregon Poetry Association conference workshop. And the, there was a prompt given by the workshop leader um, who was, was trying to get us to think ourselves back to a particular time and place in yeah. our lives. And the assumption was we would want to go back. And the more I listened, the angrier I got. Maybe not. And, and that was actually, I think, as best I recall, I wrote down in my notebook at that workshop, not for anything would I want to go back. Right. Um, so it began as an act of resistance. But of course, you know, it depended on that 
vivid recollection yeah. of what that place was um, uh, in, in, in many complex ways. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I, <laughs> I like uh, about poetry sometimes, I mean, it doesn't always happen, but there'll be sort of a, uh, a statement or a scene setting, uh, a fairly benign, uh, common, uh, th that is a shared experience. Mm. And then you get down to the end and there's that, ooh, that, mm -hmm. that mm. the little twist, the personal thing which you've done there. And uh, it, it, ta it takes it out of, it's almost in maybe the opposite way, the, the setup for a joke works because yeah. it gets you thinking that you're going in one place yeah. and then it doesn't. And I think yeah. that's what this is. Yeah. And it's, it's not that you're trying to re lead a reader down a garden path uh, just for the heck of it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's, it is, for me as a writer, it's an exploration. It's finding where, where am I going? Where is the language going to take me? Mm. That doesn't mean I leave it in a first draft version. Right. Almost never do I do that. I'm one of these people who, well, I brewed a long time before, <laughs> before anything goes on paper, then, be, then I brewed a long time before I go to the computer. Um, where I go fairly early because I want to see, get the shape of the poem. I don't want to have the mess on the page interfering with my, my sense of... So do you work that out before you start to write? Um, or at least you start to work it out? I start to work it out, but then there's this sort of give and take between me and the emerging, yeah. and okay. the emerging poem. When I began writing as a child, and I began, I began writing things I thought were poems when, <laughs> I, when, I, when I was a kid. Sure. I would, <clears throat> I would compose them out loud okay. to, my, to myself. Nobody <laughs> else heard them. And only when I thought I had them perfect would I write them down. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So the, 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 the heard poem was very important all along. Now I will read aloud and read aloud and read aloud and read aloud what I've written as I'm writing it. In, in prose as well, and in my critique group, sometimes we'll bring work, and maybe it's the first time you've read it out loud. And I don't know anybody who hasn't said, oh, I wish I'd have read this out loud to myself it's because crucial. it's different. It's crucial. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's in, in the critique group to which I belong, um, the Peregrine Writers, a Salem-based group, um, the way we handle drafts is first another member of the group reads it aloud. Oh, that makes sense. And then the writer reads it aloud. And to me, one of the most revealing, useful parts of the whole critique process is hearing my draft read cold by someone else. I can, scary. It can be very. It can be scary. Yeah. Um, having that experience many times has helped me make it less scary. <laughs> 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 but, uh, by b by not having so many problems for um, for another reader. But you hear what it what doesn't signal well. Right. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you hear things that you hadn't realized were there, which you want. Um, that's pretty rare. Yeah. But then you can bring them out. Good. I don't want to run out of time here. Can we hear another one? We can. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll switch gears, switch worlds completely. Um, this one from my second collection of poems, No Constant Hues, um, comes from the world where I live now, um, you know, which is, is um, eight acres of land in, in uh, the foothills of the Western Cascades, east mm -hmm. of Salem. Um, we have pasture, 
um, we have woodlot, etc. When we first moved there, we rented out the land, the mm. farm, the farmland, um, for uh, someone who was raising cattle. Um, subsequently, we learned to um, maintain it as a very small farming operation ourselves, mm. and we have alpacas. This comes from the transition. Okay. It's called night soil. It's in two parts. One, today the world is the heft of bale after bale of weedy mixed grass hay. It's pin jabs from cut ends of grass stalks and weed stems bristling everywhere from each twine-bound bulk we bear hug onto the stack. It's barbs of innumerable awns piercing our pants and socks, lodging in skin. It's the sweetness distilled of orchard grass and clover dried in hot sun. It's pollen-heavy clouds of fine hay dust, particles inhaled with every breath, coating our nostrils and throats. Today, the world insists it is there, harsh and sweet, right up against us, penetrant. Two, today the world is the density of wet, compacted cow dung on the blade of the shovel as I load the big wheelbarrow over and over with the dark leavings in the barn. It's the weight of each load dragging against my arms as I wheel it, bouncing over rocky, rutted ground to the slowly building berm of rotting manure. It's the sweet stench I keep smelling all day, long after I've left off digging, washed, and changed. Stink of excrement, tinged still with the sweetness of fresh hay. Feed for bull calves, confined to paddock and barn. It's the darkness of the spreading pool in which they stood to feed, lay to sleep. It's the darkness of their blood dried on the ground where it spilled, slick and red. It's the darkness of night soil, offal from sweet grass feed, turned to compost for new crops. Well, <clears throat> a couple of things. What originally got me about this is, and this may be the wrong word, it's very visual. I mean, you, again, you can just see the whole thing. And uh, sensual may be the wrong word, but, mm -hmm. but it appeals to the senses. And that was me reading it. Now with you reading it, you know what I picked up on was the alliteration. That's what you can hear that I didn't get before just reading it. but. Uh, but when it, I hear it, <laughs> it's tr the the words need to be as palpable as the things they refer to, mm -hmm. and those that that sound patterning does it to some to some ex to some extent. The the world I, I'm trying to evoke finds the sounds mm. to evoke it for me. Um, yes, those experiences are very vivid. We still do bring in the hay that way. Sure. Um, although my doctor has told me no more, no more hefting 50 to 60 pound hay bales after last summer. I got tired just listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> I got pretty tired too. Um, but, but yes, those are, those are intense, sensuous experiences. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Boy, that's something. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about Barbara Drake and her memoir. And I think, and in fact, I mentioned to her, um, I've, I've now forgotten the author's name, but uh, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and 
all, all creatures great and, and small. small. Yeah, yeah, all, yeah all the, the him. <laughs> so that um, so that you're out there in the country and and you're encountering it's that world. It's the world of animals and agriculture and so on. The, wor the world of animals is an important one to me. Um, the, uh, there, there's a manuscript I have circulating for another book which has a substantial section given over to the animals, um, a, section, a section titled Their Furred and Limber Grace, which is the, the ending line of a, of a poem about uh, um, imagining how we look to the uh, alpacas sure. that we now uh, have in our pasture and barn. Yeah. Eleanor, we predicted before we started that a half hour wasn't going to be enough, and it isn't, but we're all done. We're, we've used our time up. Thank you so much. I just yeah. really, really enjoyed this. Thank you for Maybe thank you come you. back sometime. Thank you for having me. Okay. I enjoy having an excuse to come to McMinnville, Good. and I, I love talking about poetry. Good. Well, we love it too. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, uh, again, it's, uh, it's coming up on Poetry Month, which has sort of been our emphasis. Um, so happy that you're watching. You can contact me through my website, stephenwlong.com, and uh, we'd love to hear if you have a uh, suggestion for a guest or a topic, something like that. And uh, other than that, we'll just see you next time. Thanks. Okay, sounds good. Let's go have, let's go to lunch. I'm, oh. I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can just bite too.